Hello, everyone. Welcome to the using a data lake engine to create a scalable and lightning fast data pipeline webinar. We are going to give folks another couple of minutes to join, but we'll be starting shortly and really excited to chat with you today. And hello, everyone. If, if you're here to uh, learn how to use a data lake engine to create a scalable and lightning fast data pipeline, you're in the right place. We are just going to be starting in about a minute here, and we look forward to talking with you. Be with you in a sec. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Using a Data Lake Engine to Create a Scalable and Lightning Fast Data Pipeline webinar. We're really excited to chat with you today. We're going to be uh, uh, demoing Dremio a little bit at the end. We'll be talking about modern data pipelines and, and where Dremio fits into that. Uh, and I just want to get started by, I'll start by introducing our two speakers for today. Uh, so we'll hit to the next slide here. And so today you'll be talking with me, uh, Justin Dunham. Uh, so I'm Senior Director of Strategy here at Dremio. And we also have on the line uh, Dr. Ryan Murray, who is a Principal Consulting Engineer here. Uh, for anyone who's curious, uh, Dr. Murray's thesis was on the interaction of atoms in intense laser beams. Uh, so if you have interest in that topic, feel free to email rymurr at dremio.com after this webinar. Uh, but today we will be talking about data lake engines and data pipelines. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to tell you quickly about how to ask questions on this webinar. So there are a few things that, a few buttons you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom window. The easiest thing and the best way to make sure that we see your question in a timely manner and get to it is to use that Q&A button. And we will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Feel free to ask as we go along, uh, however. So with that out of the way, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about Dremio, the company, and our, our product, the Data Lake Engine, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. So as a quick overview on us, Dremio has been around for a few years, um, and, and we are the Data Lake Engine. We're based in California. Uh, customers in all industries use our Data Lake Engine from Microsoft to TransUnion, UBS, uh, NCR, Software AG, who will touch on a little bit toward the end of this presentation, and lots of big names all over the world uh, are using the Data Lake Engine to radically simplify uh, their data architecture. We're also the co-creators of Apache Arrow, if you're familiar with that project, um, and uh, Apache Arrow is the new standard for columnar in-memory analytics, and we're seeing about four or five uh, plus down million downloads a month uh, on the Arrow project, so very exciting thing for us to be a part of. On the next slide here, I'm going to talk to you real quick before I hand it over to Ryan about exactly what a data lake engine is. And so Dremio provides an opportunity to take advantage of your data lake storage uh, directly, which opens up all kinds of possibilities for your data architecture. 
And the first thing that Dremio provides is lightning fast queries directly on that data lake storage. So Ryan will talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but we obviate the need for a lot of ETL, data warehousing, all of those things, because what we've seen in the past is folks need to add a lot of layers and a lot of machinations just to make data in their data lake storage useful. So we actually let people interface directly with that data lake storage and we make it super, super fast. And we also add a self-service semantic layer. So we make it really easy for people using Tableau, Power BI, Python, R, a whole range of your favorite data science and BI tools to access that data directly in your data lake and for that to be performant without having to worry about all the implementation details and where things are kept and so on. There are a couple other things that we provide as well here too that I'll, that I'll talk about before I hand things over to Ryan. So one thing that's exciting for a lot of our customers is that we also do live joins between your data lake storage and lots and lots of other database and storage services you have to further reduce the need for ETL. So if you are interested in multi-cloud strategy, use Dremio to do joins between S3 and Azure Data Lake Storage. If you have data stored in Oracle or SQL Server, use Dremio to join those databases to your data lake storage and still get lightning fast query speed. Even non-relational databases, storage services, and data warehouses. So if you have things, you've ETL'd some things into Redshift or Snowflake, but you still have a lot of data, uh, in, in your data lake, uh, Dremio can still help you with that architecture and provide a lot of these benefits to you. And lastly, one of the things that we really believe in at Dremio is openness and flexibility. And one of the things that we love about using Dremio directly on your data lake storage is that you continue to control the data. It's in your storage. You deploy Dremio on your infrastructure and you continue to keep data in open source uh, formats in your account, your data center. So with that, that's a quick overview of what the Data Lake engine is. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Ryan to talk about uh, what we wanted to talk about in today's webinar. Ryan, over to you. Hey everyone, uh, thanks a lot, Justin. Uh, for those of you who are planning on asking me about my thesis, it's been 10 years, so I'm not gonna be able to help you very much with that. But <laughs> anyway, let's, um, <clears throat> let's first start out, before we go any further, let's start out with what, what do we mean by a Data Lake or a data pipeline? So a data pipeline, at least for the context of this talk, is simple as the process that starts when data is created and ends when we start to extract business value from that data. So that could be, that could be a lot of different things. One example is uh, in a, say, a machine learning pipeline. You're going to be collecting a lot of pieces of data from a lot of different data sources, pulling all that together, transforming it, munging it all together before putting it through the data pipe, uh, before putting it through the machine learning model. The end of that data pipeline is the calibrated machine learning model. For something like a IoT setup, you're going to be creating, you have millions or tens of millions of devices, they're all creating measurements. Those measurements have to be collected, collated, possibly pivoted, and then eventually presented to downstream end users. So in that, your data pipeline starts at the devices and ends at your downstream users. There's two things that these, that these pipelines have in common and any data pipeline should have, and that's um, they need to be automated and they need to be timely. So the faster you can get this data and in a more automated fashion you can get this data, the better, more accurate, and faster you can make your business decisions. Unfortunately, there's, there's two things that these uh, data pipelines have in common that aren't as good. They're both complex and they cost a lot of money. We can see that from a few of these diagrams. When you start looking at data pipelines, you need to have knowledge of hundreds or even thousands of different services and technologies. You need to understand how all these technologies work together and then cater for how these di different technologies work together and fail together and you need to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money making sure all of these are orchestrated together. For me, that's really unfortunate. For everyone, that's really unfortunate because at the end of the day, data analysts, data scientists, they just want to get their data and start doing um, their work on it. And what they end up with is this complex and inefficient stack. So we see this a lot. We have a data lake. This data lake could be a Hadoop cluster on-prem. Nowadays, we see a lot more data lakes off-prem. 
with your blob storage just like S3. The common pattern for these data lakes is people just start pouring data into these data lakes. They start getting, they start accumulating a lot of stuff. No one really understands what's in them or how to use them or even necessarily what the data means. And you end up with the, the common terminologies you now have a data store. So what do people do? The first thing they do is they start putting data warehouses on top of this data lake. Data warehouse is a 30 odd year old technology and it has a lot of baggage with it. So we can, we now have to copy our data into this data warehouse, it creates a lot of fragile jobs to get the data in. And then we end up paying twice for storage and we have to pay for and maintain this, this middle tier. When that's done, our data scientists or analysts now can at least access their data using SQL, but it's still not very fast. They still don't have a really clear idea of what's in the data warehouse and they still need to wait to get new data into the data warehouse. So what people end up usually doing is creating this third tier and this third tier is gonna be full of data cubes, um, usually a lot of BI extracts for something like a Tableau extract or something like that. And in the worst case, you start getting a lot of CSVs and spreadsheets falling around. So the kind of world you end up in is somewhere where you don't have control of your data. You don't know what your data is. You have dozens of people crawling all over this architecture, trying to make sure it keeps running. And your, your business users still aren't very happy. So the, some of the data might be fast, but it still takes weeks or even months to provision new data. And there's still a lot of situations where the data, where the data pipeline falls over and the data is accessible. So not a very good picture. What can we do to make it better? Simply put, we just put, take all of that out and put Dremio in it. Sounds a bit extreme, but what, uh, what we can do is Dremio can talk directly to a data lake. So you don't need the data warehouses and the cubes and stuff. You can write SQL in Dremio and have it go down directly to your data lake files. It can then join data inside of Dremio with other databases, NoSQL, SQL, whatever you, whatever you have. And then you can present this semantic self-service data layer to, to your users. So as a machine learning data scientist, uh, analyst, a BI user, something like that, they get to poke around the Dremio UI, which we'll look at in a little bit search for data sets, start pulling those data sets together, they're writing their own SQL against those data sets, and then using them in their, in their end user applications. So it becomes a lot simpler, we can get rid of a lot of the ETL jobs, a lot of the extra technologies, and in most cases, it'll be faster. So this sounds really great. Um, how, do we, how can we take this beyond theory and start, start proving that this actually works? I thought we would do a few use cases today. I think we have, we have two use cases I want to look at. Um, one of them is something that we've actually done at Dremio. So this is running in production as part of our daily processes. And another one is a project I did uh, a couple months back now. So the first one, we're going to take a look at website analytics. This is a really common problem, especially in uh, newer companies and startups and stuff, where you have your clickstream data. This clickstream data is going to be data that's coming in from your website. So you're going to be tracking the uh, actions, what users click on, how long they spend on the website, and how they interact with all the content on your website. There's a lot of reasons this is important. Um, first and foremost, it allows us to make data-driven decisions about our website. So we can choose the content and the design based on how people interact with it the best. We can also use this to assess the health of our business. We can see how often people are coming to the Dremio web website, how they're interacting with Dremio, and how we can um, make Dremio more uh, attractive to them from the, initial, from the initial interaction. And this hopefully will lead to lead generation where we can use this use the data for how they interact with our website to tailor custom messages to them to, to help them engage with Dremio better. So this is, a, this is a problem that we have at Dremio. It has, most, well, as I said, most people have it. Our clickstream data gets dumped into a S3 bucket. When looking around for how to get the data out of that S3 bucket and present it to our executives with a overview dashboard of how people are using the website, 
we started looking at how, how we could do this inside of AWS. So this is, this is a common pattern for how it would be done today without Dremio. So you have your initial S3 bucket on the left. You're going to usually have to do a bunch of transformations to it. You might do this in AWS's Glue. For those of you who haven't used Glue before, this is a, a managed service from Amazon, which helps you do uh, ETL. And it's basically Spark underneath. So it's essentially a managed Spark service. So you'll do a bunch of Glue jobs, and then you'll end up outputting to an S3 bucket. At this stage, you've doubled your storage costs, and you've ran this managed service for a certain amount of time to create this data. And all you've really done is you've enriched it. Maybe you've flattened your data a little bit. Maybe you've um, cleaned it up, filtered some of, the, some of the bad data. So what you're going to need to do now is pull up something like uh, EMR or some other uh, heavy, heavy lifting data conversion tool. And what's going to happen there is you're going to have more, more data crunching, more managed services, and at the end of it, you still get another S3 bucket. So at this stage, you now have at least three copies of your data. You need to start worrying about the security current concerns of who can see that data and whose permission to see that data and stuff. You have a lot of copies of your data and you have a lot of um, managed services to worry about. You have to make sure that all these things are working together and uh, not tripping over each other. And worst off, you're not even actually able to query your data. It's still sitting inside an S3 bucket. So the most common answer to this problem is to uh, use something like Amazon's Redshift. So another ETL job to put your data into Redshift, another copy of your data, and now you're, you have this managed proprietary tool where you pay for the queries. Over the past couple of years, we've helped people migrate off of Redshift, and in the process, we've seen some of their bills and how they've changed. And I can tell you, if you don't know already, your, uh, your Redshift bill can quickly spiral completely out of control. So you have this extra concern to worry about. Aside from the number of services and the number of copies of your data, you just have this really expensive query engine sitting in the front of all of it. But let's hook this up to Tableau. We can now generate our dashboards and everything's great, except the performance isn't very good. You still have to pull data out of Redshift and transform it in Tableau. Common answer to that is to use uh, something like a Tableau extract. You now have added another moving part, another thing that can break, and once again, another copy of your data. But at least you're now able to get some second queries on Tableau. It might cost you a fortune and two full-time uh, data engineers, but, but, but it's working. So, so what, what's a better way? What can we do differently here? Well, let's start by just putting Dremio in the mix. So now, this is, this is something that actually is, is live today at Dremio. So again, we start out with our clickstream data on the left. Now we're transforming it once, and this is a relatively, relatively lightweight ETL job. At this stage, we're just um, extracting some fields out of JSON object, flattening a little bit, and then dumping it into another S3 bucket. So we've done a, a relatively light ETL job, and we've created a second copy of the data. But at this stage, we can point uh, Dremio at the data. And it's important to know, we're not importing the data into Dremio. We're just showing Dremio where the data lives. And Dremio takes care of querying S3 directly. So then inside of Dremio, we do all of our transformations and our cleaning and all the other stuff we need to do to get this data ready to display to our users. And then we point Tableau at it. Now here, the connection between Dremio and Tableau is fast enough that we don't need to do extracts. Dremio can query S3 so fast that we can use a live connection on Tableau. So this is great. Now we have one, one ETL job, Dremio and Tableau, and we're done. This is an example of a dashboard that's being used every day by our executives. This is just the output of this data. It's not really important how it looks, but this is, this is just a, to say that this is working and used daily at Dremio. So I'd just like to, I'd like to pause for a second, because what I've said so far is that using Dremio, we can take all of your services away. You can decondition half of your data stack, and we're going to be faster. So we've shown we can commission half your stack, 
by using Dremio, but how, how the heck are we gonna be faster than, than this complex, very long ETL job? Well, there's a couple of things that we do here, and we'll just walk through, walk through some of the components of what makes a Dremio query so fast. The first one, the easy one, is the, what's called the cloud columnar cache. So it's easy to, easy to work, but it's not easy to say all the time. So this is a, um, basically this is doing uh, caching and prefetching. So it's actually doing a predictive pipelining, trying to expect what queries you're going to do on the data lake, pull that data from the data lake and put it onto uh, local fast storage like NVMe or uh, SSDs or something. So once it's there, Dremio has effectively instantaneous access to that data and it doesn't need to wait for uh, Azure or S3 to come back. This is particularly important because uh, some of these cloud blob storages can have extremely long tails and latency tails. So you can be waiting seconds to get some request back from your S3 buckets. So by doing this, we can see an immediate 10 times throughput. Next step, we add in data reflections. I'll get, I'll go deeper into data reflections later, but for now we're talking about them as um, a really interesting mix of traditional um, database indices, something sort of like a materialized view and something sort of like data cubes. What you're able to get out of them is transparent um, access to fast pre-computed data. So you're, your users are still querying the underlying data sets, but they're actually, the Dremio query engine is rerouting them to this pre-computed data that's living on uh, direct fast storage. And in, uh, in most cases, we're gonna see a good 100, 100 times increase. I've seen significantly more for the right use cases. What's quite nice about these is we also get rid of the extra complexity of managing um, your data cubes. So then the next big speed increase we can see is coming from Apache Arrow, which Justin mentioned before. The, the reason that this is fast is this is a columnar data storage format in memory. So we're able to take advantage of all the things from modern CPU architectures. We're able to do um, factorization and take advantage of CPU caches and all kinds of other really cool, really interesting things to get another easily another five times speed up of that. And finally, and the newest kid on the block is uh, Arrow Flight. And this was officially released uh, by the Arrow, Apache Arrow community, mm, I think a good, maybe less than a week ago now. But what this is, this is our, our replacement for uh, ODBC and JDBC. So these are fairly old technologies and um, they're, they're row-based. They, they create a lot of, a lot of copying. What Arrow Flight allows us to do is move an arrow buffer between, say, Dremio and the client with a zero RPC, so just straight over the network. And this is easily, when done in parallel, this can give us well over 100 times speed up. Currently, this is only supported in Java clients and uh, in the Jupyter Notebooks Python environment. We expect to see a lot of other people start to adopt this as, as the uh, Arrow Flight becomes more mature. So that's a, that's a brief overview of how we can be so fast on the data lake. So these four technologies is what allow us to do effectively sub-second queries on, on the data lake when, when you couldn't get sub-second after massive stacks of, of complex pieces working together. So with that, I'd like to talk about our second use case. Uh, this, is, this is a little fun project that I did uh, in the springtime. So I was uh, at a few months off between jobs before I started at Dremio. I've been a huge IoT fan for quite some time. I've always been into the home automation thing. And for years, I've been buying anything that looks exciting on Kickstarter. So <laughs> over the past couple of years, I've collected literally buckets full of sensors and Arduino boards and all kinds of other goodies. I said, now that I have some time off, it's finally time to put all these things in action. So spend some time remembering how to solder, put all these things together. I now have uh, sensors scattered all over the house. My girlfriend loves it. And I'm now able to tell you things 
really fun things. I can tell you the temperature in every room in my house. I can tell you how many volatile organic compounds get put into the kitchen every time I cook a meal. And I live in a flat in the UK, so I can tell you that yes, it is still raining. So I can tell you all these things, I can gather all this data, but what am I gonna do with it? So the traditional way of doing these things is say in Azure, something like this. So this pattern looks very familiar to our, from the last example. Here we have our devices creating uh, data sets. This is getting pushed into the Azure IoT Hub. Then the IoT Hub writes it down to Azure's um, ADLS V2 for us. So from there, we need to transform our data. Again, this is, this is very similar to before. We have some big Databricks jobs doing ETL pipelines for us, creating a copy of our data again. I have shown in this example using HD Insights, you could very well be something like the Azure Data Factory or something. The point here is that again, pulling data out of data, Azure data storage, doing a lot of transformations on it and then writing it right back down. So after a few steps, we managed to get it into something like a SQL Server Data Warehouse. And at this point, again, we've created a lot of copies. We've opened up ourselves to exposing all this data in a lot of places. For me, this is a hobby project and I've had to pull in all of these things and suddenly I have a few hundred pound bill when I just wanted to look at my IoT data. But at least now I can expose it from SQL Server into Power BI. Now for my small project, that's fine, I'm done. If we wanted to scale this up to thousands or millions even of devices, there's no way the connection between Power BI and SQL Server would be enough. So we'd immediately think, well, we'd let's use something like uh, AAS, uh, Azure Analytics Service. And now we're back into the old problem. We're having to create and manage cubes. So we have a lot of moving parts, a lot of data flying around, a lot of services, a lot of cache, a lot of time. And same as before, how can we do this in a better way? Well, we have this with Jemio. This is, this is running in my personal Azure account. I'm creating data, I'm sending it to Azure's Event Hub. Using Stream Analytics, I'm actually doing on-the-fly transformations before writing it down to Azure Data Storage. Once it lands in Azure Data Storage, I only have one copy of the data, but it's clean and it's ready to be put into Dremio. Inside of Dremio, we'll have a, have a bit of a look in, the, in a minute with the demo, but the idea is Dremio is gonna do some transformations. We're gonna create a few layers of, a, of transformations and then display the data out to our dashboard again. For, now, for my dashboard, I've chosen a Dash by Plotly, it's an open source application in Python. And I chose this mostly because it's really fun. I can use the flight connector from Dremio and I can really pull in all of our, uh, all of our speed benefits in one app. So for me, the single person app, this is gonna run at, at or just above the free tier for Azure. So this is something that I myself can run. It's fairly cheap, it's fairly easy to run. I don't have to do much. Of course, this is, this is a relatively simple architecture and it can scale almost infinitely. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes. So here's, some, here's, here's just the results. This is what the dashboard looks like. I can uh, hook that up from any, anywhere in the world. And here's some of the throughput stats for my, um, for my uh, event hub and the stream analytics and stuff. So as I said, this is a really good way for a single person to play with their own IoT. What's uh, really interesting is we've partnered with uh, Software AG. Software AG is a big player in IoT and they have effectively the same architecture as I showed earlier. They have the same thing running in their software stack. So they're pushing hundreds of thousands or millions of metrics a second from all over the world into their operational store, which is then transformed to be served to Dremio via their data hub. So this is something that was just recently announced by Software AG. It's a really good partnership for us. And if you're uh, into the IoT stuff, let us know later and we can, we can talk to you guys in Software AG. So with that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start the demo. Let's just move over to Dremio. So I'll start with a, just a brief look at how Dremio looks 
when you open it up the first time. And you can see we have our sources, our spaces. We have a wiki page over here for each source and space that we can do queries and jobs. This IoT source is uh, ADLS Gen 2, and it's setting up to point at our Azure data link that we set up earlier. For now, I'll take a look at, these are all the other sources that we can set up. So we can connect directly to S3 or Elasticsearch or on, on disk if you prefer. And if you were to connect to something, this is the kind of, kind of form you'd have. You can just fill this out and it'll connect to Azure. And then you'll get a set of things like this. This purple means it's a PDS or a physical data set. This means that Dremio now understands how this data set is structured and how to query it. This is just a folder. If we were to go in here, we'll see, well, nothing, but you'd normally see a pile of JSON documents or something like that. We can just take a look at this and we immediately open up with a SQL editor and a preview of our data set. So we can start writing SQL against this and we can run preview to short preview of our documents. With spaces, we have something similar. In spaces, we're going to have these green ones and these are VDSs or virtual data sets. And what we have here is effectively a chain of data sets, which are just SQL statements that are talking to the other VDSs to create, uh, to sequentially clean and prepare the data sets. So we can take a, take a look at the raw weather, for example, and this is the final cleaned output where we have the room, the sensor name, the value it saw and the time it saw it at. If we were to take a look at our graph, we'd be able to see how this data set was constructed. So we can see our weather app, we can see the columns in this, in this VDS, and we can move back through our chain of VDSs to get all the way back to our PDS and then eventually our data source. And you can see here, we've also done a join against this physical data set living in my home directory, which is just a set of, which is a small CSV file to translate sensor device IDs to, to the room they live in. So with that, we also have this uh, most recent data set, and this is a, a very small one. This is just a pre-aggregation of the, of the uh, current live values. So you can take a look at our dashboard. This is the live dashboard running. When we refresh it, we've actually gone back to Dremio, executed it, and pulled back the results and rendered it. And you can see how quick that is. We are able to get that speed through reflections. And you can see here, this is a query that was running against that particular data set, and it's running in less than a second because it's been accelerated. Now, I'd just like to take a second to um, fully appreciate what happened there. From the raw data set, this Pi IoT living on Azure Data Lake, we have something in the range of probably 10 million, 15 million records. And these are stored in hundreds of thousands of JSON documents. And because of Dremio, we've been able to create a SQL layer over top of that and be able to execute uh, queries on that particular data set in less than a second. So that's getting 15 million rows and we're able to pull the important data out of it which in this case is only 29 records, but we can still do that in less than a second. And this is mostly because of the magic of reflections. So we can look at this reflection. We can see we've created a raw reflection on this data set. And all this is doing is it's taking all of these columns and writing them all down to a compact parquet file that we can understand and read very quickly, usually on local storage. So this is very much like a materialized view in a, in a traditional database. However, you can, use, you can use the materialized view without having to reference it specifically. And then similarly, we can have aggregate reflections. And these are more like uh, BI cubes where we can have dimensions and measures. And on those dimensions and measures, we form all of the cube values that we need to be able to quickly compute aggregates. So here we're getting all the power of something like Azure Analytics services without having to manage the cubes ourselves. We just have this, this UI and then Dremio takes care of refreshing and managing those, those reflections. And this is, these are some of the things that are reason why we can do such fast queries on such large data sets. 
So with that, I'll go back to the presentation and um, I'll open it. Well, I guess, uh, Justin, you probably want to finish it off and then we can start some questions. Yeah, sounds great. Well, um, before we get into Q&A, thank you, Ryan, so much. That was a, a wonderful overview. And we've got some great questions here that we're going to answer. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but there's some good stuff here. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about just some things that you'll be able to do uh, right after the webinar. So you can actually deploy Dremio right from our site at dremio.com slash deploy. Uh, and we also have Dremio University for learning Dremio and the Dremio community, which we have uh, staffed by Dremio engineers. We can ask all of your questions. And I'll, I'll revisit these again just before we close out. But for now, I want to switch over to uh, Q&A a little bit. So we've got some really, really good questions here. And, and one question we've gotten a couple times, by the way, is about the recording. So I want to make sure that everybody knows on this call that you will be receiving a link to the recording and the transcript uh, very shortly after the webinar uh, is complete. So uh, let me start off. Uh, Ryan, we'll, we'll kind of tackle these together. Let's talk a little bit about how Dremio manages security um, and access control. So I'll say a few things about that. Um, Dremio has a, a ton of features related to this um, from uh, integration with AWS to single sign-on with Azure to uh, role-based access control and uh, data masking and all sorts of other things like that. So that's one of the really helpful things about using Dremio as a layer here is that uh, Dremio lets you get very, very granular control over exactly who has access to exactly what data. And Ryan, I don't know if you want to add anything there about uh, sort of things you're seeing in the field and with customers. Yeah, I think we can uh, uh, briefly talk about what Dremio can do, and I'll, I'll guide you through some of the demo as well. I think there's a few stages of security that are interesting. First is at the sign-on stage, and we can we can support LDAP or any a lot of the other SSO um, paradigms, especially anything OAuth two can be handled. We also take care of um, pushing down security. So if we're connecting to something like uh, Hive or Hadoop or something, we can integrate with Kerberos so that we can do uh, things like impersonation on a lot of the underlying data sets. And then inside of Dremio, there's uh, sort of three layers of, of security. So on, on our folders or workspaces or data sets, we can control um, sharing. So this can, this can be limited to specific users or to specific user groups, depending on if you have LDAP set up. So you're able to control who can see which spaces, which VDSs, which PDSs, and who can edit them. And the other two features we have are uh, row level security and column level security. And these are both done via the SQL uh, interface. So you can tell Dremio that um, only this group is allowed to see column X and all the other groups should have column X max, maxed out, say it's a credit card number and they'll only see all X's. Or we can say filter all rows for users and user groups who are part of so-and-so team. So from that, we can control exactly which cells are shown and which data is shown in those cells. And we can also control uh, access directly to the individual data sets and data spaces. Great, thanks Ryan. One other question that we're getting uh, here is, is it possible to add connectors that are not on that list uh, that you showed Ryan? And uh, uh, I'll hand it to you in a second to add more, but I think one thing we're gonna talk about here to answer this question is Dremio Hub. So Dremio Hub, which is a dremio.com slash hub, uh, is both a marketplace for connectors. So we have, uh, I think about five or six up there now. We launched Remio Hub a few weeks ago, and we have sources like Snowflake and Salesforce and Vertica and some other ones as well. And on top of that, Dremio Hub is also uh, a set of capabilities in Dremio that make it very, very easy uh, to build your own connectors for your own data sources. So I know that Ryan, for example, has done some work on a, a KDB connector, and I, and I know that other folks are working on things. and creating a new connector for, for a relational source especially is literally just a matter of, uh, uh, of editing a, a, a YAML file and a couple of other things as well. And Ryan, I don't know if you want to talk a, a little bit more about that piece. 
Yeah, I think you you are absolutely right. The um, with Dremio Hub, we have a SDK which allows you to build a connector from a JDBC driver. So if your source has a JDBC driver, then it's a matter of you know a few dozen lines of YAML for a config file, and that will that will fire up a connector. Um, if you don't have a JDBC driver, it's it's fairly complicated. The uh, driver that Justin mentioned for KDB is um, is quite a hefty one, and it changes with every release. So I I think it's quite a bit of work, but it's certainly doable. And uh, I'm happy to talk more if people are interested in the non JDBC drivers. But we've seen people in in Dremio put these JDBC based uh, SDK drivers together in in literally minutes and hours. Great. We, we've got a bunch of questions here, uh, Ryan, related to Apache Arrow and kind of, you know, you mentioned that a few times. Can you just take a minute and, and talk a little bit more about the story there and some of the capabilities and what Arrow is really doing for us? Yeah, so I think um, Arrow started a couple years back and as, as Justin mentioned, it's growing exponentially. I think because it has such broad application to data science and data science is such a thing it's it's really starting to take off we can see we can see here the kind of people and the types of groups that are starting to use arrow as the core of their product and we have huge support across across data languages uh, programming languages so i've i've personally am a committer on arrow and i've been involved in some of the c++ java and python stuff but we have hundreds of people committing there and uh, some of the things that make it so fast for us, uh, one thing that, that we released maybe six months or so ago is something called Gandiva. This is part of the Apache core now, Apache Arrow core. And what this is doing is it's taking um, a SQL expression, a filter or project or whatever it happens to be, and it's compiling it down into uh, LLVM bytecode. And it's doing that uh, just in time on the fly. So that, uh, takes uh, a simple expression, which in Dremio would be written in Java, but it can also be a pandas operation or something. And then it'll compile it down to machine language before executing it. So with that, you're immediately taking advantage of all of the power of uh, LLVM-based compilation. And you're getting, you're leveraging the vectorization and the SIMD instructions. And this could even potentially be applied to GPUs and all kinds of other really interesting projects. So this is, these are some of the things that are getting the real, the real bump out of, out of Apache Arrow. The other thing is the Arrow flight. And this is, for us, we're trying to uh, sell this as, not sell this, this is uh, a viable replacement for ODBC and JDBC. As Justin and I were talking earlier, these were created around the time of Clinton and uh, George Bush, the first. Uh, so they're, they're, <laughs> They're rather old. Uh, they're rather old standards by now, and we think there's a much better way. And with something like Apache Arrow, we're able to transform data frames from inside of Dremio to Jupyter notebooks, for example. We're able to do that in parallel uh, without having to copy memory around. There's no marshalling your data um, translations. It just is directly copied between one computer and another, and we're immediately able to leverage that power, especially in something like Spark. Um, you can find some work that's been done on a Spark adapter for Dremio online, and something like this is able to achieve hundreds of times the speed up because it's able to talk to all Dremio executors at the same time. Great. Yeah, and Aeroflight is especially exciting. Um, you know, as Ryan said, it, ODBC and JDBC are just for a kind of different universe. Um, and today, you know, we're using distributed stores. There are all kinds of changes that have happened that really make Aeroflight very, very exciting. And you can see that even today with, with uh, Jupyter connections to, to Dremio. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk very much about, and uh, we have some questions on it here, is deployment options. And one specific question we got was about running Dremio and Docker. But um, you know, Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the some of the ways that people are actually uh, deploying Dremio and and, uh, and and scalability options there as well? Yeah, I think um, this is a really this is a really fun story. So I've I personally have deployed Dremio on everything from 
large Kubernetes clusters down to a Raspberry Pi. There's tons of different options to deploy Dremio. Um, my favorite option is using the image on Docker Hub. So when I need to test something for a client or if I'm working on site, I'll just uh, use Docker to immediately spin up an image and I can immediately start testing. Uh, a lot of our clients nowadays are starting to use Kubernetes. Uh, we have a Helm, Helm chart for that already. We have a lot of improvements coming on that Helm chart in the near future. And I've seen people get set up and running a production quality Dremio install uh, using the Helm chart in, in a matter of hours, less than a day, certainly. So I think there's, and then the first time I installed Dremio, I used the tarball. That was way back uh, just after version 1.0. I just pulled down the tarball, ex extracted it. I had Dremio running within within minutes. So I think there's there's a wealth of options to suit every need. I hope. Yeah, and and on those deploy pages on our site, you will also see um, you know links to marketplace templates. Um, easy, it's very easy, quick to deploy on S3 as well. And and as Ryan said, we've got Helm charts and Docker images and. Uh, on Hub and all kinds of stuff like that. So super easy uh, to do and, and very, very flexible. Uh, the, the last question I'll, I'll pull here, and, and we got a lot of questions, which is wonderful for folks whose questions that we didn't get to, shoot us an email. Um, and also you should uh, expect someone to reach out to you as well, because we'd love to answer all these questions. But the last question we'll kind of field here real quick is just kind of about the impact of creating reflections uh, we know, you know, you might have a de deployment where you've got a billion JSON documents in ADLS. Um, you know, are those all being stored in RAM? Where are reflections actually being stored? What is the data format? What's the burden as far as, uh, uh, as storage and stuff like that? That's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. So, in short, the, the reflections themselves are stored as Parquet files on uh, on disk and the disk depends on the Dremio configuration. The recommended configuration would be uh, back into say the Azure data lake or S3 or something like that. And then using column or cloud cache, you would actually start to cache those locally on disk on the NVMEs or the local disk as well. So you have a couple, couple options for where or how those are stored. With column or cloud cache, we kind of make sure that um, obviously the disks don't full up and the hottest data is ready to go. As far as the, the impact is a really interesting question because we've seen a number of places who have turned on hundreds or even thousands of reflections and haven't really seen a performance impact. What's really important is that uh, you, treat, you treat reflections sort of like you treat uh, indices in a Oracle database. The intelligent placement of a single reflection can give you 100 or 1,000 times speed up. But putting a reflection on every single data set um, may not help at all. It might actually make it worse, especially depending on the size of your cluster. You can get in a situation where your cluster is actually spending more time reflecting, calculating reflections than it is answering queries. So it's a, it's a question that's really close to my heart. And uh, if you reach out to me by email, I'd happily talk you through some more of that. Great. Well, thank you, Ryan. I think, I think we're going to um, go ahead and uh, close things up for now. Uh, again, we would love to answer. Uh, we have dozens of questions, which is wonderful. Love to answer them all. And, and please reach back out to us. You can reply to any email you've received from us. Uh, you'll also uh, get a follow-up email as well from somebody at Tremia. So love to answer all the questions that you have. We really appreciate everybody being here. And a few, as I said a few minutes ago, a few options here uh, for those folks who are, who are interested in engaging more in the meantime, go ahead and deploy Dremio. The community edition is open source and totally free to deploy and very, very easy to deploy um, on an AWS or uh, on Azure. So you can go to deploy for that or on-prem for that matter. Uh, Dremio University is our online university that gives you free courses to introduce you to how Dremio works and some of its features. Um, and, and how to use all those things. So that's a wonderful resource to check out. Go sign up there at university.dremio.com. And then the last place I'll point folks to if they're interested is our community site. So the community site is used for you know, everything, can be support, questions about the product, 
questions that we weren't able to answer here. Um, and that's staffed by Dremio engineers and other folks here, and you'll get a quick response. So go check out the Dremio community as well. Um, and uh, I, I think that's it. So we'll, we'll thank everybody for their time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Have a good one. Thanks, y'all. Bye.